Thank you for being here. We want to present questions that are on everybody's mind and then present ways that we can grapple with those questions. Our tagline is ask questions, think new, and fear not. And that's exactly what we're going to try to do tonight. Chris Johnson, pastor of First Baptist Church, is joining us here tonight. I'm grateful for you it being so here, Chris. It is so good to be back at midweek. Absolutely. Uh, this is perfect. It's so fun to be with you, Brian. Uh, Thanks for putting I'm this together. Looking forward to it. Very glad you're here. I am too. I really am. Tonight, we are really honored to have as our special guest for part of this time, Dr. Ruth Berggren, who s serves, she's an infectious disease specialist, and she serves as a consultant to Bear County and to San Antonio uh, on COVID-19. And so, uh, Dr. Bergeron, welcome. We're so glad you are here. Can you still hear us? Is that possible? Okay, great, great. Uh, I'm so glad. Um, and now, um, just recent, just now, just a little bit before we uh, went live here, some new uh, so-called transitional protocols have been released that will help us, help guide us in opening up uh, San Antonio and Bear County after a long lockdown. Would you, Dr. Bergeron, guide us through what that means? What are these transitional protocols? Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you all. I hope to be helpful. I have been very actively involved at the city and the county level ever since uh, this whole COVID business began and uh, now know more about it than I ever wished I knew. <laughs> I'm uh, sure. But I'm, I'm here to be full and, and here to share it. Um, I have, am part of a group of 20 people from around the city who are public health, infectious disease experts, and even ethicists who put together some um, a health transition document, which is now be, has now been presented to the mayor and to the county judge and uh, is also presented to an economic transition team. Those folks are taking the health transition team recommendations and getting more specific about guidelines uh, for the city of San Antonio. All of this happened uh, just about simultaneously with the release of Governor Abbott's guidance. And what the uh, economic transition team is doing right now trying to help create one playbook for San Antonio. So you don't have to go look at the state guidelines, the health guidelines, and the San Antonio sure. economic guidelines. And it's going to come out in a way that the minimum guidance is what's in uh, Governor Abbott's recommendations. And then there will be additional guidance for striving for higher level of safety. Am I coming through clearly? You are, Dr. Berger. And, and, and now, okay. when, when you, this is a, an incredibly massive undertaking because, uh, like you say, it's state and, and local uh, municipalities, uh, local municipalities working together with the state, and it's taking into account economics, uh, public health, uh, these large sectors. Uh, can you guide us through the high points of what those transitional protocols are going to look like. All right, um, somebody needs to mute. I, I hear a lot of background noise, um, so somebody's not muted. Um, but I'm gonna continue <laughs> on if I can, just to We'll do our highlights. best, absolutely. You might like to know that um, included on 
both the health transition team and the economic transition team is Dr. Ken Kemp, who is a pulmonary and critical care doctor, but also the senior pastor at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. So uh -huh. we have Kenneth Kemp, a that's right. Baptist minister. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's great. Both teams, and he is incredible. Um, I just thought you all might enjoy. Yeah, I had that. no idea that he was um, involved. That's great. Uh, we start with some guiding principles. We, we do want folks to know that uh, we kind of took an ethics perspective and, and very definitely not a political perspective in applying uh, scientific evidence and public health literature to this whole process. And so just quickly, our guiding principles are beneficence, meaning that we're prioritizing the community's well-being and we recognize that health as well as economic prosperity are very tightly linked. Uh. Um, we have the guiding principle um, that we are offering evidence-based decision-making and very importantly, responsiveness to new information. Mm. It has been busying how quickly information and guidelines change with this COVID-19 pandemic yes. and our guidance uh, will be updated to reflect new information that becomes available in the world, in the scientific literature, and stuff that we learn about our own community. So do it. one thing you can expect is that uh, there will be updates and changes to these recommendations as time goes forward. It, we respect individual freedom and privacy. Sometimes there have to be restrictions on an individual's freedom. Um, when it comes to controlling the spread of a very deadly infectious disease, but we are committed to making those restrictions um, as least, least restrictions necessary to achieve mutually agreed upon goals. Um, we offer the principle of trustworthiness and have made every effort to be unbiased and to place the community's best interest above our own. And we also have a commitment to protect those who are most medically at risk and that includes certain marginalized populations. So um, we engaged in a process of reviewing the literature, consulting with experts. We convened on Zoom meetings uh, several times, uh, divided up our team into writing sections and, and then uh, developed this overall approach. So it hinges upon progress indicators and warning indicators. Those things help us know when can we move forward and do we need to retreat back to a more restrictive level of and existence? Dr. Berger, and if I may, indicator, if, if I yeah. may interrupt just a second, progress indicators and what is the second set of indicators? Uh, the second set of indicators are warning indicators. Warning, so okay. Progress, indicator, progress tells us when we can go forward. Warnings tell us when we might need to retreat or they might tell us that we can't keep moving forward until things get better. Okay, all right. So to give you an idea of what those are, the progress indicators, there's four of them. The first one is a sustained decline in the number of new cases of COVID-19 for greater than or equal to 14 days. And by the way, um, there are several different ways of looking at our data from San Antonio. Um, one way is to say that if you look back 14 days ago, we're, we're definitely much lower today than 14 days ago. Mm -hmm. Another way to look at it is if you look at each day and expect each day to have a lower number than the day before, uh, we're not really at that point yet. I see. So there's different kinds of ways to interpret that first indicator. The next indicator for progress is the ability to perform tests for the virus in all people with symptoms of COVID-19 and their close contacts, as well as people like healthcare workers who are in public facing roles. We estimate that we need to be able to perform about 3000 tests a day in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and we're at 1600 tests a day. So we're doubling so that, that we need to double that capacity. Uh, yeah, roughly. the number 3,000 is actually coming from two different places. We didn't make it up off the top of our head. Um, Governor Abbott recommended that we be able to do 30,000 a day in Texas. And if you adjust for the population of Bear County, I'm told that comes out to Bear County needs 3,000 tests a day. Okay. And that also actually aligns with guidance that's coming from um, one of the Harvard Global Health Institutes that makes population-based recommendations uh, for testing capacity. Okay, great. The third progress indicator 
is the ability to contact trace. So if somebody's uh, COVID positive, we wanna find out who they've been close to and then go, go find those people and test them or interview them to see if they have symptoms of disease with the goal of isolating anybody who might have it and prevent further spread. To contact trace well in San Antonio, we're gonna need 175 people that are trained. We already have some people, we have medical students that are working really hard as volunteers, but we don't have the full workforce that we need. It's not gonna be complicated to get there. You don't have to have an advanced degree, really just a high school education, uh, but you do have to have some training and some supervision. So we need a little time to get that organized but I don't regard it as being something that will be a big barrier to us. Okay, great. The fourth indicator I have good news about. Um, the fourth indicator is a prepared healthcare system that can safely care for all patients. It means we have sufficient hospital capacity, we have workers, we have protective gear for all the healthcare workers. So that's good news. Good, good. Those are the problems. Um, as you all know, um, we're being told on a statewide level to go ahead and open up on Friday. Mm -hmm. It is the position of the health transition team that we have not met all the criteria in these progress indicators. So we're recommending a lot of caution and the guidance that comes from the state should be the minimum and the, health, the economic transition team is gonna come out with this playbook that will show some additional measures that can be taken to strengthen us and help ensure our success. Let, Dr. Bergeron, since there is some tension there between the, the two perspectives, the state uh, giving pressure to open up and the, this task force saying we're not quite ready, uh, the way that you're addressing that tension then is to say proceed but with great caution. Did I understand that correctly? Right. Okay. We're saying, we're saying um, given that we are proceeding, um, here are some extra things that you can do to make it safer. Okay. Understood. And, and would you lead us through the warning indicators about yeah. what, when we pull back? So there's three warning indicators, um, and it, it'll be the job of Metro Health to monitor these and report them to us. The first indicator that's a warning would be a decrease in the number of days it takes for the number of cases in our community to double. So a decrease in the doubling time is a warning indicator. The next okay. is an increase in the percentage of COVID-19 tests that suggest active infection. That's kind of a no-brainer, sure. right? Uh, cases going up, but not just absolute cases going up. We expect some to go up as we increase testing. If you test oh, I two see, or three I times see. Well, you'll get more cases, but you want to, a, a warning would be if there's an increase of the percentage of the tests that are positive. Okay, not just the raw numbers going up, but when you adjust for percentage. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, and then the third warning would be um, if there's an increase in indicators of health system stress, and we actually have a, a system in San Antonio for calculating if we're at a low, medium, or high level of stress in our health system. And it depends on variables like um, personal protective equipment, hospital beds, ventilator capacity, and also looks at um, increases in emergency medical system calls. So those are our three warning indicators. We haven't uh, drawn any red lines, um, but just have said these are what need to be monitored. And if we start to see change there, then we would expect um, health experts to interact with our Metro Health Authorities, our Emergency Operations Center, and our city and county leadership to make decisions based on what the warning indicators show. And what would those be? They would either be stop, don't expand further, or mm -hmm. they could be retreat back to a phase one, which is where we're at now. Okay. Now, Dr. Berger, and, uh, it seems as if once these, once Friday comes and, and these, and the task force is monitoring uh, uh, what's going on, that uh, it seems that San Antonio and Bear County would then uh, have some freedom to operate independently of the rest of the state, depending on whether or not we think it's time to pull back uh, based on task force recommendations. So that might, that could happen, 
correct? Is the rest of the state is going along and San Antonio and Bexar County might pull back if there's a spike, for instance, in number of, of cases? I, I think our, our leadership could certainly recommend pulling back. Um, how enforceable that will be is a legal question that oh, kind I see. of exceeds my wheelhouse. As okay. A yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there, there are some, some uncertainties uh, inherent in that system. Uh, okay. That's a massive undertaking. I mean, all of those yeah. questions together, that's amazing. And I'm, I'm very thankful that y'all are working uh, very diligently on this. And we want to uh, get that word out and, uh, you know, so that everybody can support that as much as possible. I'm wondering if we could uh, move to some questions here that, that we have. And sure. before we do that, though, where can people obtain copies of these protocols? Where can they see um, these? So it's in several places. Um, this particular health team transition document was published in, in its entirety on the website of the San Antonio Express News. Okay. It's available. To, um, you can also access it, I believe, through sanantonio.gov. And oh, okay. it would be accompanied very soon in the next couple of days by the economic team, uh, transition team document, um, which we hope will be a unified kind of playbook that incorporates the health recommendations and also um, points to the state recommendations and simply highlights areas where we can go beyond what the current state recommendations are to try to be safer. Okay, so there's more to come with this economic this economic literature. Okay, that's fascinating, and thank you for that. Um, so again, uh, we can go to the City of San Antonio website, sanantonio.gov, uh, but also the uh, Express News, San Antonio Express News website, for those of you uh, who would like to see copies of those transitional protocols. Um, now, <clears throat> Dr. Bergeron, um, we are a, a church, as you know, Churches and nonprofits, um, and I know that you you did address uh, some of that in these transitional protocols. But uh, what can we best do as a as a church, as a nonprofit, to help at risk populations who can't shelter in place because they don't have a place, uh, or or who do not have access to hygienic resources? How how can we best marshal our resources and thinking in that direction in a public health uh, perspective? So let me lay a little groundwork before I dive into some of the specifics. You know, we look at, at different sectors and assess their infectious disease risk. And the parameters that we look at are contact intensity, number of contacts, and modification potential. Those are three things. And you can get a low, medium, or high score on any of those three things, and then you can kind of get a total risk assessment. Okay. So contact intensity means um, are people sitting really close to each other? Are they less than six feet or are they farther away? That's one part of intensity. And then the second part is how long are people in this setting in close contact with each other? So low contact intensity would be like walking past someone in a store and a high contact intensity would be sharing an apartment with someone. Sure. So then the second one is the number of contacts, which is how many people will be in the setting at the same time. Higher numbers of people in the same place at the same time raises the risk for COVID-19 transmission. And then finally, we have modification potential, which considers how easy is it to modify the activity or the setting to reduce the risk. So settings where it's easier for people to remain six feet apart have a higher modification potential. And the CDC has a whole document that describes these mitigation strategies across many different settings. And um, our document references that CDC document and gives you a link to their website. So we then go down through all the categories and we start you know, with bars and restaurants and schools and retailers um, and so on and so forth. And to get to the part that you all are most wanting to hear about um, for uh, churches in particular in, in phase two, um, I'll tell you that 
based on the risk assessment, um, churches are in the highish end. Okay, mm -hmm. they're not really medium; they're in the highish <laughs> end. Right. And one strategy is that we open places of worship with masking, alternate distance seating, staggered sessions to avoid large crowds, and then strong promotion of virtual sessions for those who are really medically at risk, which of course, I think you all know by now, include our elderly, anyone over greater than- Of course, or yes. People to 65 years old, people with heart disease, high blood pressure, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, or people who are immunocompromised. And we also suggest that some sessions could be more safely conducted out of doors if the weather permits with distancing. So that is a strategy to help churches. Okay, very good. And, and as, we, as we turn our attention to uh, people experiencing homelessness, uh, as churches uh, often do, uh, and, and we uh, promote benevolence ministries and so forth, uh, is it, um, can, can we address this partially, at least, by having resources available such as uh, masks and hand sanitizer to uh, make sure that folks uh, who, are, who, who don't have a home or who don't have access to hygiene uh, can, can be living as safely as possible. Would, that, would you? Yes. Thank you so much for raising that issue because uh, folks who live in congregate settings, like people who live in homeless shelters, yes. they are really medically at risk. And it's really hard to modify their living conditions. And I, I need to tell you, that there was a recently published set of papers by the MMWR, that's a publication that comes out of CDC. And they looked at homeless shelters in California and in the state of Washington. And um, in one case in San Francisco, they found that 70%, 70 of all of the people in the homeless shelter were COVID positive. Um, and they concluded wow. uh, in their article that we should start doing testing more widely of asymptomatic people that are okay. in congregate settings and the folks who work directly with them. So if y'all have members of your church who are regularly volunteering in um, those homeless shelters, I mean, I know we Haven for Hope is, is our major one, right? Sure, absolutely. Um, then folks who go into those homeless shelters or settings like that, congregate settings, um, are people who may in fact be appropriate for testing even if they're asymptomatic. Because if you're an asymptomatic spreader of COVID-19, you really don't want to go into a place where there's super vulnerable people. Okay. Now, the other part of that is what can churches do to help protect those folks? Sure. And a huge one is getting masks to them. Okay. Many of them do not have masks. I've been consulting for the jail. And when we got started mm -hmm. on this, the jail was asking people to reuse the same surgical mask over and over and over until it got wet or torn. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, we've been able to up the standards and we got a lot of more masks in so that we have one mask per person per day. Out in the community, I don't think you all need to be thinking about surgical masks, but um, people can make really good cloth masks, and that's a, an activity that church members may choose to engage in. I'll bet you have people with a lot of talent in that area. Yes, yes. Um, guidelines for how to make them properly exist, again, on the CDC website, but also at the STRAC website. STRAC is the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council for Emergencies, and STRAC has some incredibly detailed and excellent instructions for how to make cloth masks. So that would be a wonderful way to reach out. Um, as a city, as a whole, we should be preferentially looking for at-risk people, like the ones I mentioned, and making sure those guys have the hand sanitizer, have the um, environmental surface cleaning stuff, uh, yeah. and that they have educational materials. Um, remember that these folks oftentimes have limited access to information and internet. So um, being able to educate community groups like this while you 
give them or make available to them the goods that they need to protect themselves. This is all really very good. Okay. And can help save lives and help prevent a big surge in our community as we start to get back to work. Excellent. Thank Do you. I think Chris has Yeah, a Dr. Vargren, this is uh, Chris Johnson. I did want to ask, you mentioned before about the potential of, of maybe uh, testing volunteers who have been volunteering. Uh, they, they may be asymptomatic. And so we, we've been hearing a lot about testing um, and testing those that are asymptomatic. We're, we're hearing some testing, too, about anti antibody testing. Will you help us uh, understand the difference and maybe um, uh, how you test those who would be asymptomatic or and then uh, the difference of that with what an antibody test would be and maybe the value uh, of that as well. Sure. Um, so the two big concepts to realize is the, the test that you hear about where they're swabbing the back of your nose or the back of your throat, that is a molecular test doing something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where we're actually looking for little fragments of the RNA of the virus. And when we find that, you know, we consider that to be a positive test. And the other test category, and I'm going to say it's a category because there's a bunch of different ones within this category, is looking for proteins in the blood that you only make if you've been exposed to a pathogen like COVID-19. There's a bunch of them that were kind of abruptly released into our world under emergency use authorization and they are not all created equal. Some of them have been more validated than others. And we are unfortunately today, not at a point where we can confidently tell you what your antibody test means. Mm. And that's not news that anybody wants to hear. Right. And I, I was saying something differently, but if you have IgG antibodies, they come in two flavors, M or G. M is the early one that probably means you're still actively infected. G comes uh, a little bit later and slightly overlapping with the M. What everybody wants to hear is that if they've got IgG, they're not infectious and they're protected. And okay. we don't know that for sure. And, okay, and how, how, long, how long will it be before we, do you think, that it will be before we have some kind of reliable antibody test. Yes. So we have. We, I want to give a couple caveats because if anybody is recovered from COVID and went to the blood bank and tried to donate their blood so that convalescent plasma could be used to treat somebody else, you will know that the blood bank will test you for antibodies and they will use a titer, meaning a number, a ratio of uh, antibodies in your oh, blood to okay. determine whether they think you have enough convalescent antibodies in your plasma to be of good to someone else. So I don't want anybody to come away from my little presentation here thinking that I said that antibodies are not usable at this time because that's not entirely true and in certain contexts we are actively using that antibody test to figure out if somebody's got convalescent plasma that they could donate. Okay. But for the average person, we don't know um, what level of antibody titer is going to protect you from getting infected again. I see. That's one. And we don't know how long, if you're protected, we don't know how long that protection lasts. We can guesstimate based on what we know about the SARS epidemic. So SARS was in about 2003, 2004. SARS is a coronavirus and folks who recovered from that appeared to have protective antibodies for two to three years. Now, we can hope that that will be the case for COVID-19. We don't know it yet. If it's true, it'll be good news because by the time those protective antibodies wane two to three years later, we will certainly, I really believe, have a protective vaccine by that time. Okay, and so, sp speaking yeah, of that, I, I, I'm wondering, I read some news yesterday uh, out of Oxford, England, that uh, they believe that, uh, some scientists there believe that a vaccine could be ready as early as September. Is this just uh, pie in the sky? What do you think is our earliest window, time window for a vaccine? 
So I don't know about the Oxford vaccine in particular, but on average, we, you know, the earliest would be 18 months. Okay. So, um, 18 so we, we could be looking at a year and a half from now at, at minimum. I, I think that's more realistic. And it does mean that we're going to have to be super cautious this fall. As you all know, fall is when respiratory viruses kind of come back. We have kids going back to school. Influenza uh, becomes prevalent and rises. And uh, many, many people, many experts are very concerned that we uh, will see another rise in COVID-19 this fall prior to the availability of vaccine. So we have some time right now. I, I really think we've been blessed in San Antonio um, for the low number of cases and the very low yeah. number of deaths. Absolutely. We, we, yeah. You know, we're I, sorry about every death, but and sure. every death is too many deaths. But Absolutely, we have much much lower mortality than many other places, and I believe that's because people paid attention, and we had a timely warning, and we implemented these these mitigation measures very, very effectively. Now we could get into trouble this fall because of the biology of the disease and relaxing our restrictions. And that's why it's gonna be so important for us to help one another as a community mm. to uh, monitor, to follow the guidelines and make sure people have what they need and targeting the people that are most at risk. If we, we don't pay attention to our nursing homes, to our jail, to places where people are living together in congregate settings, we will have problems. And so we need to go out of our way to target those folks and make sure they have what they need as well as the education they need. You know, you, you are calling, uh, you are speaking to an organization who uh, is, takes its marching orders from one who said, you know, whatever you do to the least of these, you've done to me. And so uh, I just take that as further affirmation that we must be paying attention to uh, those who are highly at risk, because this is this is part of the weakness uh, of the human race that that we are called to pay attention to, and you're you're reminding us uh, that that is our that is part of of the core of our calling, and I appreciate that so much, um, Dr. Bergen. We're going to have to leave it there uh, at this point, and you have been very gracious. Uh, to give some of your very valuable time to us. Uh, you've, you've been a little busy uh, with uh, this other, uh, these other tasks, and, and everybody is, is clamoring for some of your time. And so I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you have spoken to us and have helped our congregation to know a little bit more about what we're looking at. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be with you, and I wish you all very well. Good health, peace, and good health. And yes, same to man. you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bergeron. Good night, uh, Chris. That that was uh, some of that was not that great a news, really, and and it's a little still grim. And I'm reminded of of the grimness of of mm -hmm. this. I you know you you go along here and you think. Uh, you know, it's a pretty day and things are looking up and, you know, we're talking about reopening and yet there are these caveats just lurking, you know. Yeah. And so um, I, I want to talk a little bit, and again, thank you again yeah, for being here. I want to talk just a little bit about, about church and about <clears throat> how you uh, have been impacted as a pastor by this pandemic. How has it shaped your thinking, Chris? Um, how is it shaping your thinking? What do you notice that you haven't noticed before? And, and uh, what you are know, you one, thinking? One of the things that, that I feel like this has brought to my mind through all of this is that even in difficult days, God is stirring and God is at work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those difficult days come as sort of a judgment of God. Other times those difficult days are just part of life. But either way, I think you see how God shapes us through difficulty. And so I've been trying to look at, that, look at this in that way. How, how is God shaping us through this difficulty? 
And so that you, you don't push it away, you don't run away from it, but you, you lean into it and you lean into the difficulty and say, Lord, I surrender to your shaping of my heart in this. And, and I just want to lean into it and see how, God, you work through me in this. And maybe that's a moment of confession and repentance where you're working through some kind of judgment or just on the other side of that, I'm just growing as a person through the strain of life. Right. You know, I, I appreciate you saying that so much because uh, we, it, it's not a passive kind of thing that you're no, talking about here. No. It is not just, you know, hunkering down. And, and I think it's the, the worst by. thing that we can do, Brian, if, we, if yeah. we take this as a passive moment where I'm just sitting at home staring at the TV for a month, Oh man! Uh, we, we are going to be um, hurt emotionally and hurt spiritually through that. And I think it's important for us to lean into this and say, God, what are you doing? And, yeah. and not just what are you doing globally. What are you doing in my heart through this so that I might be um, purified and my heart might be strengthened in you through this ordeal? You know, um, I, you have the example of, of the fleshing out of what you're talking about with you, I've noticed, has been these uh, times that you have spoken at the beginning of the uh, live stream on yep, Sunday mornings. Right. And, you know, I've, I've mentioned to you before uh, mm -hmm. how uh, both sobering and um, energizing yeah. that time is. And some of the things that you have said, and I, I think this past, I think it was this past Sunday, you, you uh, and actually this was in part of your sermon, but you talked about uh, saying thank you. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, when you come against something like this, pandemic and and somebody stands up and says okay so who are you going to say thank you to at first that's kind of jarring yeah but then it it's actually exactly what you're talking about. It is. How are you going to lean into this time? That's right. And one of the things that we've seen throughout Daniel, there is this there, there's this refrain of we fall when we magnify ourselves, we are raised up when we magnify the Lord and we mm. give God glory. And so yeah. in this, the Thanksgiving is a part of that. Do, do I thank the Lord for my health? Do I thank the Lord for my recovery? Do I thank the Lord for bringing us through this? Who, who am I giving credit mm. for the good things that happen along the way? Because it's God alone who deserves the credit. He, he's the healer. He is the source of hope. And so as this unfolds, uh, I need to make sure and give the Lord the credit uh, for every breath that I have and for every moment of hope that all, all along the way. And as I lift him up, that's going to raise um, my heart. You know, it, it just struck me that as you were talking that, you know, you're at the beginning of, relatively the beginning of your time here right, at yeah. FBCSA San Antonio, FBCSA. I hope uh, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unless you know something I don't. <laughs> Have the we end got news is nine. For you, <laughs> the end, no, no uh, join us next week. Uh, but uh, you, this is this is really uh, something that could impact you and shape how you absolutely carry out your pastorate for the rest of your life and mm -hmm. and uh, decades from now at FBCSA. Uh, you know, you might be able to look back and say some of this was tempered in the fires of pandemic, you know, right. decades ago. And everybody wins, Chris, uh, through that. When, yeah. when you, I think, I think that that is really heartening to hear, you know, leaning in and standing, uh, act, you know, being active in this uh, time instead of just, you know, saying how long is this going to go on? Right. I mean, that's really not the question. Right. Uh, it's what are how are we going to live while while this uh, yeah and G happens. Jesus calls me to be faithful today, and so how how am I going to live faithfully to the Lord today? He's worried about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Yeah, but but Jesus just live faithful to the Lord in what we've been presented with today, and that's uh, right. He, he'll take her tomorrow, and so we're just going to try to be faithful uh, in this next step and it, see what God does. It's like a case study in that. Mm -hmm. really. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Okay, and now let's talk a little bit more about what you envision for the church from this point. And I, I know, you know, the, the crystal ball gets kind of clouded sometimes, but what, how 
is life at First Baptist Church in its budgeting allocations and uh, uh, the projects that it undertakes and so forth. Um, in, in one sense, we say, well, we're just going to go, you know, and do what, uh, what we're, mm-hmm. we've always known is right to do, and that's true. But what do we do in the, in the details? How is that going to look uh, as we make a budget for 2021, for instance? Sure, uh, yeah. Well, I would say one of the things that we're very thankful for, and, and we, we didn't know how this would impact us when this all began, but our church is so generous and has maintained giving, and um, it has been a beautiful thing for us to see how the, the, how the church has glorified God in their giving in this time, uh, and we've been blessed in that way. So we, we praise the Lord, we thank the Lord for that. And so we're, we're grateful as we're moving forward because we are still able to do much of what we hope to do this year um, in that way. So, so as we budget, we, we've been looking carefully that, mm. you know, even now that may not maintain. The economy is teetering, right? So what, what happens right, right. If, if the economy uh, corrects further? And by correct, I mean oh, just yeah. plummets, yeah. Right? <laughs> right? So what, what happens if the economy uh, uh, plummets? And so we always try to be diligent in looking at those things, but... But even so now, you have to be uh, extra diligent, right? right? Make right. sure that you're looking at all of those possibilities. You know, what happens? How do we approach this if the economy tanks or um, if people aren't able to give like they want to and, and how those things unfold? And so, you know, you try to work through multiple scenarios and then you, you kind of track it through the year and, and see how it uh, unfolds. And so, you know, we, we try our best um, to look at these kinds of worst case scenarios when we're planning a budget, and we certainly will looking at 2021. If if any church can do that, it's it's First Baptist San Antonio, Absolutely. and that's that's really heartening. Yeah. Um, on the on the positive side, it seems like you know in in our community ministries, for instance, we've had an an upsurge in our capacity Absolutely. to work with agencies and and direct with uh, people who need the help and the benevolence, um, and and, it, and also, we've seen an upsurge in how we have used technology around here. Are, are either of those, or maybe something else, uh, some ways that, that we could be shaped in a positive way uh, going forward uh, in our church life? I mean, uh, maybe we become a church that is more, um, uh, that builds up our technological infrastructure a, a little bit more. Sure. Or that, can you know, when this is over, I can't see that our community ministries um, capacity will just go back to what it was. I mean, it, you know, so some of these things will, will sure. last so beyond speak, now, right? Yeah, yeah, let me speak to community missions first. One, one of the things that I love that Byron has done, we, we targeted specifically groups that we were already working with. So kind of on the east side of downtown, um, many may not know, we, we've, been, we, we've had a, a basketball um, kind of clinic and, and coaching and, and program going in uh, here Wednesdays and Thursday nights with yeah. with kids from the east side of downtown that has just been phenomenal. We'll have 70 people coming to those things and just using our gym and doing, doing good work. And so we're working with the YMCA there and then a church uh, on the east side of downtown called La Luz. Um, mm, yeah. And so we, we started our program of how we might help the city um, with those that we're already working with through the Y, through La Luz, and uh, working on the east side of downtown. And, and what that means is we're, de- we're deepening those relationships, right? And so those relations of, relationships are now being forged in the fire of pandemic, and yeah. those are becoming so strong that, you know, I know that, that Byron is going to continue that work, and we will continue to support that as a church. And, and this is Byron Pitts. Byron the, Pitts, the, our, yeah. Yeah, our community uh, missions pastor. And so that has been phenomenal. And right now, we've been helping 150 families, or we're working on helping 150 families a week. But, but these are people um, that we have a connection with. And what yeah. I mean by that is it, for the gospel to really take root, it's best to have a, a longer-term connection yeah. than just leaving some groceries on the doorstep. And so that's what we're working towards is, is long-term connections with these people where we're helping them week after week, month after month, year after year, mm. developing long-term relationships with people. And I think that's the best way to do missions is through those long-term deepening relationships. And, and Byron has been phenomenal at that. It, it, he has, and it's just really quite moving actually mm-hmm. to, to be involved, mm-hmm. uh, for people to be involved in that. Um, and check that out. Uh, if you, uh, if you really are looking for something to do here, being involved in community missions, 
uh, is the way to do that. Um, you asked about technology too. Do you yes, want me to speak yes. technology? Yeah, yeah, please. So, so with technology, you know, one of the things that we have been amazed, and this has been so encouraging to me, I think last week we had 850 people in Zoom, like Zoom Sunday school. Uh, which unbelievable. Is, is, that is unbelievable yeah, to me. Yeah. And one of the things we see, some of our classes have more people attending now than before. That's exactly Be, I've because, experienced that. Because we, we have access through, uh, uh, through the technology to be able to meet remotely. And, and so the question now has been raised. With some of our classes now having more people in them because of this, do, is this something we need to maintain? Do we need to have Zoom access to our live classes? That's a great question. Uh, for people who are um, remote. We've, we've even had people Zooming in now who've moved away. Well, that's absolutely right. In, in and one still of, want to be a part of Sunday school. Yeah. Right. One of the classes I'm involved in has regularly somebody zooming in from Colorado who, who was part of this group and had moved away, uh, and now somebody who's temporarily in South Dakota, too. So there, there's that happening all over Absolutely. the place. Yeah. And I love the question of how, you know, how will that continue, because we don't want to just say, well, that's all over now, and it, right. because uh, it's, it's fluid thinking, and that's, that, right. that, that really right. is good. And by the way, I want to uh, let you know that uh, you can certainly... Um, Ask questions if you'll go to slido.com and type in the keyword MWW, type in the code. Uh, you can send your questions direct into me. I, I uh, thought you were going to make a pug, plug for the pastor's class there. There's a pastor's Sunday school class you can, you can zoom into now. So if you, if you want to do that as well, you can. Yeah, Chris just made that plug. So uh, <laughs> take note. Um, and, uh, but tell your Sunday school teacher if, if you're going to jump ship and go to, go to that class. Um, but anyway, slido.com, uh, MWW is the code if you want to ask any questions here. Um, Chris, how do you think, and speak to this just, you mm -hmm. alluded to this just a little bit, but how do you think the pandemic has altered, if at all, the, our society's view of church? I, I don't know if it's altered society's view of church, but I will say, I think it has um, really shown a light on the church, and I believe there's a lot more people paying attention to the church right now than were before. And what That's I mean by that, we're, we're having um, a, a lot more people watching the broadcast. Now, some of those are from other churches, um, but we're having a lot more people watch the broadcast. We're having a lot more interview requests. I think I've done four on-camera interviews yeah, you know, now yeah, and things absolutely. like that. Um, and I'm seeing that from my other um, brothers in ministry, you know, a, a lot more um, interviews through through media outlets and things like that. And, and I think people are watching the church more than they ever have to see how the church is going to respond. And is there, is there any hope in the church? And I think people are watching carefully um, to, to see how the church responds and, and how that could affect them. You know, it's... The day is quickly passing and may have already passed in which we're excited because our pastor's on TV because it means we get some publicity. I think, I think the, mm -hmm. the, the bigger payoff there is people get to hear the voice right. of the church yeah. in general society right. uh, yeah. rather than just saying, you know, hey, look at us. We're saying, what are we, we say, we get to speak. Right. We get to speak yeah. to this city. And of course, in a very literal sense, when you're being interviewed, that's the case. But also when a, a box of food is being delivered, you know, and, and, and uh, to a, a doorstep, that's, you know, speaking, the church getting to speak there. But I love the fact that folks are saying, they're putting a microphone in your face and some of the faces of these other pastors and saying, talk to us about what's going on here. Right, right. Uh, that's, a, that's huge. Um, what do you say to this church, Chris, when the fall comes and if there is another round of this? I mean, I, I want to say, Lord, you know, may it not be, but I think we have to face that possibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it can be demoralizing and discouraging. Yeah. What do you say? So I, you, you bring up a good point. We have to deal with the reality that there is a chance that this is going to happen again in, in the yeah. fall, right? There, there could be a spike. And I think as we look at that, we, we, we look back on this, this experience that we're having now and, and recognize the good that came out of it, the way people have responded. And, and I cannot say uh, enough about how our church has responded 
and how our church has um, stepped up and how our church has really been flexible in this time yeah. and, and how we have worked diligently through it all. And uh, That's absolutely right. And, and the, yeah. the second time around, um, which we hope doesn't happen, but if it comes, uh, we'll have a set of skills and tools to be able to handle it much more uh, than we, we did uh, six weeks ago. Okay, that, I, I guess I, I kind of knew that, you know, because we're, we're exercising the skills and tools, right. you know, every day now. But you putting it like that is very reassuring because it's not, we're not starting over. Right. Uh, we're just going to go back to We this. may be starting over emotionally, <laughs> but, but other than the, the emotion of it, the, the actually living it out, we will be better prepared. We're, we're better prepared for square one than we used to be. <laughs> we are. Uh, we are. So, okay. Well, that's, that, that is actually very reassuring, Chris. Yeah. Um, there, there is a, a question coming in here. Will this quarantine affect church attendance when we are allowed back into church? What's that going to look like? Yeah, it's a good question. So we're working through right now, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm on knees in prayer, um, talking with a number of pastors in the city. I've been, been in contact with about 40 pastors in San Antonio. Well, and then another, That's awesome. an, another 40 or 50 in the state as well, wow. just in a couple of different groups, about you know, how, how are we going to do this and how are we going to, how are we going to do this together. And, and you see the state recommendations are right now 25%. Hopefully May 18th, that, that moves to 50%, right? And so yeah. um, in these initial stages, um, you know, they recommend we, we don't gather, right, with, with, with everybody in the room, sure. right? And so sure. it will be smaller numbers and smaller groups. Um, I think 50% is, is easier logistically and, and maybe a better target for us to mm-hmm. be able to hit um, when we can do 50% of the room and kind of every other pew and the, every other seat, those kinds of things. Which um, you're, you're talking later in May. Sure, yeah, that's what we're looking at, and we're praying through when's that going to be for us, and and how does that open, and we're going to try to do it with other churches in the city, and that's what we're looking at later in May, how to do that well. Great to coordinate. Um, But as we look long term, you know, what does that mean? And we don't know the answer to that. You know, Mm -hmm. one of the fears um, as pastors is we look at that and say, you know, the the pews are empty right now, you know, what if nobody comes back? You know, that that is one of the fears, but I, I think... Um, as we, we look at the possibilities here and we look at the way the church has responded so far, like I said, uh, I, I can't believe how many people are in Sunday school right now. Uh, and I, I think that's a positive sign for when we come back, the, the people who will be back with us. And then kind of the same thing on worship. And we've had astronomical um, worship numbers on live stream and TV. And, and I, I think you'll, you'll see those people um, you know, coming, coming back into the church. But, and, but we don't really know what that's going to look like. And it may be kind of a hybrid so that all numbers go up, you know, live mm-hmm. and live, I mean, sure. in person and live stream. And let me go back to the, briefly here, to what you said about Sunday school, more people, a mm-hmm. lot of people participating, mm-hmm. more than 800, approaching 900. Um, not only are there more people, Chris, but, and you've probably experienced this, the conversation and the discussion in those gatherings mm-hmm. is phenomenal. Yeah. It's, it's not just everybody on mute, you know, except this talking head, it really is more interactive uh, than it's ever been. Yeah, my heart tells me, and I'm an optimist at heart. No, but, I, I've but, noticed that, <laughs> and that's my, great. My heart tells me, I, I think we're going to come out of this and see, see growth. Mm. Um, we may not. Uh, we don't know what's going to be on the other side of this when we can finally gather a hundred percent. But but my heart tells me that God has been in this, and 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 I think we may see some growth out of this. Uh, that would be that would be just a, a story of the ages. Uh, it would be, I mean, yeah. um, okay. <clears throat> how can this church? We're going to just wrap this up here. How can this church pray for one another yeah. and for you? Sure. How can that happen? One of the things, this doesn't directly answer your question, but it goes back to something we talked about earlier. We need to be on our knees in thanksgiving, hmm. giving the Lord for credit for the good that's going on. Yeah. Um, uh, for our own emotional state, but also just for our own spiritual state, to recognize God's in control of this and, and to be in those prayers of thanksgiving. And in that way, thank the Lord for one another, right? Because one of the things that we hmm. recognize in this um, though we're meeting uh, through technology, 
we recognize how much we miss the touch of one another. Yeah. And just, you know, thank the Lord for the relationships that we do have and, and, and um, ask him to, to bring that back. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard people mourn, and this is, this is true, and we don't know when this is going to be lifted, is, you know, the struggle with coming back. You know, say we come back at 50%. Right. Um, but we're not allowed to hug each other. Hmm. You know, we're, we're, we wouldn't be um, as loving as we like to be here. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to miss that. And, and that's going to be hard, and that, that's going to phase in over a very long term. You know, and, and how, do, how does that come back? Well, wow, that's so, so weird, and, and it, but it's true. Right, and so I think we just pray for those relationships with one another. I think, you know, we pray, whoever God brings to your mind, pray for them, call them, encourage them, and just pray for that relationship, mm. you know, that, that, that'll be deepened. And, and I think with that, as God brings specific people to your mind, pray that their heart would be calmed. You know, I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, I, I've sensed that I've needed. Um, it's just a calm through this because it is emotionally draining, yeah, you know, is. with the change that we have faced. And so you think through, you know, asking for, for prayer for me. I mean, one of the big deals, uh, one of the big things we're looking at right now is how and when do we begin to worship again? And so, you know, those are, those are leading to sleepless nights and things like that. It's kind of like leading up to Easter. How do we do this well? Right. Kind of the same thing right. here. You know, how do, how do we get back together cautiously, safely, but where we can praise the Lord together in the same room? You know, how do we do that? It's a wisdom with that, right? So a calm heart, uh, wisdom, and, and I think we all need that. And I think we can play, pray for one another in that way. I think we'd be blessed. That is so exciting to contemplate prayer like that. Uh, thank God for one another. I mean, that is what you heard right. Chris say just now. Thank God for one another and pray for calm hearts. And also, pay attention to who comes to your mind. Exactly. Um, That's right. And, and God, God brings people to your mind for a reason. Mm. And, and I would encourage you, and this is what I tell our prayer group. So, you know, we have like a prayer group on Thursday morning. When we're praying, if God's to bring somebody to your mind, pray for them and then text them or, or call them and say, let know, them know. Let them know that, that you're praying for them and God has brought them uh, to your mind. That's just a, a beautiful way that is, is not um, dependent on whether or not there's a pandemic. I mean, exactly. prayer cuts That's through right. all of that That's right. uh, with great ease. Chris, thank you for being a part of this Absolutely. tonight. Uh, I, I think that your uh, words and your perspective um, gives a, a voice of reassurance. I love how you said tonight, uh, and again, I've, I and anybody that spends five minutes around you could, would notice this and does notice this. You said you're an optimist, and I, I think that's very, uh, that's a characteristic that that Christ loves. I think, I think uh, our Lord loves that, and I think we can go a long way on that kind of, of uh, perspective. Yeah. Optimism. Um, because God is good, yeah. and so there's always good ahead somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being a Absolutely. part of this. And everybody, thank you for tuning in uh, tonight uh, to hear some news and some perspective about the pandemic, but more importantly, to hear how we can live above uh, the, the troubles and the fears, even while we experience them. Um, and next week, we'll have a conversation with Aaron Hufty. Who knows what will happen? That all bets are off. But um, anyway. Will you, will you ask him about dancing in the sanctuary Sunday morning? Oh, well, I heard oh, okay, that good. aside that you made, <laughs> and I'm not sure exactly what it was happened beautiful. there. It was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I will. I will relish asking him about that. So tune in for Dancing in the Sanctuary. Not Dancing with the Stars, but Dancing in the Sanctuary uh, next week. Actually, seriously, next week, midweek in the city, 7 o'clock, right here. We hope to see you there. Thanks and good night, everybody.